problem for the microphone. We tested everything but that earlier. Hey, thanks everybody for coming out tonight on a, uh, a little bit of a, a rainy night, and um, I, I'm so proud of the the uh, John Paul II Center here in the Integritas Institute for having programs like this. Um, they are very atypical, very unusual, and, and I'm sure very informative about very important issues that, uh, that, that, that are out there that confront people in the real world every day, that confront people in their professions uh, every day, confront people in the business world every day. And uh, as I was talking, gosh, about a year ago with Father Andrew about perhaps helping out here, I, I, I quickly scratched my head when he was talking about ethics in the business world and realized that in the media business anyway, traditional media business that I was in, um, the one thing that we dealt with almost every day in one form or another was ethics. Um, ethical dilemmas that came your way, ethical problems that presented themselves, um, things that you really had to scratch your head about and, and think over and, and puzzle out and try to do the right thing. It was um, a, a just, just sort of a constant everyday um, uh, occurrence. And, and I, I thought it, it thought it made sense that this series was here to try to give people a little bit of a sense of um, the, the, the ethical dimensions in, in various, uh, various businesses um, across, the, across the spectrum. The journalism media business has um, its own peculiarities. Um, it's a very interesting business, um, and, uh, and the ethical um, situations that you find yourself, uh, that, that you find yourself confronting there are very unique. A lot of people, when I told them that I was going to be just discussing ethics in the media, you know, they're, they're saying that's an oxymoron. Um, there's no ethics in the media. You know, what, what, what are you talking about out there? Um, I used to have, I once had an editor who was from England, and he said, you know, what are you talking about ethics? That's a, uh, that's a, t that's a little county outside of England, or outside of London. He was talking about Essex. Um, he didn't want to know from, from ethics. Um, but it's a you know very interesting topic, um, Father. If you could hit one of the slides, uh, I, this is the, one of my favorite people in Chicago. He's the former assessor of Cook County, James Houlihan, and uh, I would occasionally have lunch with him. He is a happy Irishman um, who is very prone to to smiling, so that's not an unusual picture, um, uh, not an unusual pose for him. But we were over lunch one day, and I casually mentioned that I thought the media were uh, unbelievably ethical. And he started laughing like a hyena. Um, and, and, and halfway through this laugh, I said, you know, actually, I, I'd go even further. I'd say that the media in general are ethical to a fault. And he then proceeded to laugh for probably about another three minutes. This was, this was a reaction coming from a guy who was actually very well liked and very well regarded um, by the media. Um, and and I, I tried to puzzle out from him a little bit why he, you know, why he had that reaction, why he just felt that the media was incredibly unethical. If, when you're in the public eye, you occasionally have bad things written about you. Um, somebody, if you have bad things written about you, somebody is doing their, somebody is probably doing their job, and you might feel that you've been, um, you've been mistreated. But as we talked about perceptions on why people don't think the media is necessarily as ethical as they should be, a couple of things um, came about. And if we can take a look at the next slide, I've just put together a couple of images here. You know, this is a, this is an image of kind of the media as excess. Um, you, you've got you know somebody who's very newsworthy being covered here, but look at the amount of people surrounding him, and that's not even a uh, uh, an out of control example. Sometimes I think people in general, people outside the media, even though they love the media, even though they think they understand the media business a little bit, they feel it is just excessive. There's too much going on. There's too many impertinent questions being asked that things are being pushed a little bit too far. Father, you know, along the same lines, I think that, that um, the traditional media business, which is what I'm talking about here for the most part, gets a very bad rap from what I would call kind of the, um, the paparazzi culture, um, which, is, uh, which is kind of media out of control. Um, we have seen everything from um, uh, stars and celebrities being hounded in a very kind of uncomfortable way to actually 
destruction and death being uh, death occurring at, at the hands of, of, of some of the paparazzi. That's not what I'm talking about here in terms of ethics in the media. That's not even the media as, as, as I'm defining them. It's, it's, it's a tentacle of the media, certainly, but um, it's not what I'm talking about, but I think that what goes on in paparazzi culture kind of paints um, a picture in people's mind that that's what goes on in, in all of the media. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about excess earlier. You, you've also got a situation where the media goes too far. Um, again, doesn't really happen. Uh, this is the example of Rupert Murdoch and his um, one of his editors in chief, Rebecca Brooks, Brooks, who were involved in the um, phone hacking scandal, among other things, in England, um, where the tabloid culture is very different than than virtually anything that we know in mainstream media um, here in the states. But again, it's one of these situations where it just feels that the media has gone too far. You know, they're hacking into 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 private phone records, into into people's private lives. And again, there is that perception that the media in general is somehow out of control and not ethical and not following any guidelines or 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 any controls. Father, you know, I was thinking in in Chicago anyway. Um, one we grew up with kind of the front page culture. I don't know if that means anything to, to, to some of you younger people here, but the front page is um, you know, a famous play that was turned into a couple of movies over the years that looked at the old fashioned Chicago newspaper culture of say the 1920s, um, where it was a bunch of hard drinking, um, uh, you know, late night staying up guys who, who were in intense competition with each other and would stoop to nothing, um, uh, or would stoop to anything to get the story, um, sometimes even making things up. And if you've seen the movie or the play uh, at all, they, they really become part of the story, and they are so completely unethical um, that, uh, that it's, it, it's kind of unbelievable. But um, uh, I think there are a lot of people in America who kind of still think that this is the way it is, um, that, that this is kind of, um, uh, an out of control profession, kind of, kind of a pre. They look back on its pre-professional um, era, and they think that that's what's still going on, and that journalists will do anything to get the story and, and break the rules, bend the uh, bend the rules, and, and and find themselves in the middle of the story, sometimes making things up. Then we've got, you know, the, the culture where the media seems to be obsessed with um, what I just call celebrity and idiocy. Um, you know, you can, you can say what you will about, uh, about uh, the folks that I pictured up there, but uh, God knows there has been an incredible amount of ink and bandwidth um, spent on, on covering them over the, uh, over the last couple of years. And they're not the only two examples of, of, of what goes on. Um, you know, the media can be said to have created celebrities with no appreciable skills or talents uh, that are evident. Um, again, I would argue that that is not really the traditional media um, that is doing this. This is kind of celebrity, celebrity culture. Um, when I'm talking about the media, I'm talking about serious traditional journalism, um, newspapers, and their website. Um, but again, I think the media gets kind of brushed with, with, with these kind of broad strokes. That's all you do. A couple of years ago, I was up at Marquette University, my alma mater, and they were celebrating the 100th anniversary of um, journalism education at Marquette. And they asked me to be on a panel for a TV show um, with about seven or eight other people about issues in journalism at that point. And you know, I was up there as a representative of, um, of the Chicago Sun-Times, and I spent um, a good portion of, of, of the segment being attacked by other people on the panel. Um, they were all complaining that, you know, well, you're the old-fashioned media, and you guys are devoting all this time and attention to Lindsay Lohan and the, and the Kardashians when you should be doing big, huge, important um, things. And you know, again, there was this perception that that's all that the media cares about, that they're leaving all the serious stories uh, uncovered, um, untouched, and that, and that everybody is obsessed with what's going on in kind of the celebrity culture. And I had to stop some of these people that were attacking me and you know, tell them, gosh, you know, if we had run something about Lindsay Lohan that day, it was probably from a wire service. Um, you know, we didn't have a reporter who was out covering it. The story was maybe that long. 
um, and it was just sort of an interesting little squib that, um, that, that, that brightened or lightened the, some of the entertainment coverage in the paper. But had we really spent any resources on covering this? No. And I said, you know, just yesterday I was involved with um, editorial board um, endorsement interviews of candidates uh, uh, for public office. We had, were in the midst of doing something like 80 interviews with, with candidates for public office. And, you know, I said, people don't realize that all the hard work that goes into that. You, you're kind of vilifying us for this celebrity culture when there's actually all of this hard work going on. And the vast majority of the column inches and the pages and on the broadcast are about much more serious stuff. So I think in people's minds there are there there, there just is this this thought that the media is is kind of dunderheaded and kind of following the pack and leading people down the down the wrong path. When in reality the the, 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 the opposite is true. Uh, you know, and kind of the final thing that I think puts. Um, uh, media and ethics, uh, you know, provides kind of a bad context for those two words together, is the perception that if it bleeds, it leads. That's kind of a, uh, that's a phrase from the broadcast uh, industry, the local broadcast industry in, in particular, which is driven by pictures. They need to have something to put on the 10 or 11 o'clock news. And if they've got crime or violence or an accident or something, it tends to um, it tends to be uh, the thing that leads the, the the broadcast, and a lot of people say that that turns them off. They don't like um, uh, you know essentially a, a sometimes a minor story taking up that much uh, real estate or broadcast space. They don't like the interviews where the uh, uh, the footage where the reporters are sticking a microphone in, in grieving parents' faces. Um, they just don't like that entire violence uh, culture. I mean, one of the reasons that the TV stations are still continue to do it um, uh, after all these years is that despite what people sometimes say, it's obviously something that they watch. It's, it's something where there are ratings attached to it, and, and it has proven to be somewhat successful. Um, in the in the newspaper business, we would get complaints uh, from time to time about you know you guys are covering too much violence, you're covering um, too much crime. Um, you know where's the good stories um, that 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 should be in the paper? And you know by and large, you have to educate people that you know yeah that's it's a very good point. But um, what is the definition of news? It's something that is unusual. It's something that is a little bit outside of uh, the norm. And sometimes, unfortunately, in a city like Chicago, news is um, uh, sometimes of a uh, you know certainly violent or bad uh, perspective. So you know it's a, a difficult line you do have to draw. But again, I think that the the, the public's perception um, with all of these things that I've I've, I've just outlined here is that. You know the media is not necessarily operating from the from the uh, the best ethical standpoint. However, this this chart I thought would be a little hard to read, it's, and, and it probably is, but it's not as bad as I thought. This this is a, an, a chart from the Gallup organization, which each each year takes a look at <clears throat> industries and uh, uh, does a poll asking people about their their feelings on the industries and judging them on their trustworthiness. Um, so this, this has to do with ethics to a certain extent, but it's kind of interesting, despite everything that I just told you, um, I expected journalists or media people to be a little bit lower than they are. Um, you know, they're, they're not exactly great, um, but they are somewhere in the middle, if you can see. Of course, nurses, physicians, uh, I'm sorry, pharmacists, medical doctors, dentists, um, are, are all up at their uh, up there at the top? College teachers, clergy, um, uh, psychiatrists, chiropractors, uh, more in the healthcare industry are all there at the top. Journalists come in somewhere, kind of quite nicely, in the middle, and they of course are always um, happy to be ranking higher than members of Congress and used car salesmen who are always at the bottom of, of this list. Um, so the perspective is is not quite as as bad as I as I as I painted, but that's still not you know an incredibly wonderful place to be somewhere in the middle. People obviously are, have, have doubts about uh, the trustworthiness of the media, which is you know just sort of uh, amazing to me because in America at least that that is the thing that the media tries to to, to hang on to the most. It's the one thing that you are trying to sell. 
which is your credibility and your trustworthiness and your honesty. Uh, because without those kind of things, people will turn away from you pr pretty instantaneously, and you will not you will not have too much of a too much of a business that that, that you can sustain. So while better than I thought. Um, uh, it's not quite as, as, as good as it should be for a profession that pr prides itself on facts and on honesty and credibility. Um, what many people probably don't realize and what Assessor Houlihan, um, who I pictured earlier, earlier didn't, was that journalism, again, in America, because it's different in other countries, uh, but journalism in America is imbued with, with actually one of the most stringent sets of ethical guidelines um, that, that are out there for you know, any profession. Um, while these ethical guidelines are not law, and while violators are, cannot be prosecuted, um, it, the, the ethical principles tend to be something that are taught in every journalism school, every communication school, um, at, at kind of the earliest levels. Um, you know, the teaching will be broader in some places than others, but by and large, ethics in communications, ethics in journalism is something that is, is very much um, paid attention to. And it, ethics, a, a code of ethics, a conversation about ethics is something that has been present in every newsroom that I have ever been in. Um, you know, again, journalists, by and large, what are they motivated by? <clears throat> they are uh, freedom fighters, and they are truth seekers. Um, you know, that's what they want to do. They, they, they want to, to um, uh, comfort the afflicted and, uh, and, and, and afflict the, the, the comforted. These are people who are um, uh, on a mission, uh, in, in many cases, to, to do the right thing, to be as factual as possible. And they take that code of ethics, um, those rules to live by, very, very seriously. Um, good journalism and, coincidentally, good journalism ethics really boil down to three questions. Um, and I think anytime you think about journalism, anytime you think about journalism ethics, anytime you look at a story and you know, think that something is wrong with it, or you want to kind of run it through a, an interesting ringer, ask these three questions of it. Um, is it news? Is what you're reading or what you're seeing on a broadcast, is it news? Um, is, it, is it something that rises to the level that, uh, that, that, that people need to know about it, they should be engaged by it, it's just interesting, it, d d does it rise to that occasion? If, if, if something is not rising to that occasion, you might have a little bit of an ethical dilemma. You wonder, how did that story get, get on there? Why are they doing that? There must be some other motive um, behind it. So in assigning stories, in, in reporters looking for stories, that's the first thing. Is it news? Is it, is it worth knowing about? The second uh, I've alluded to is, is it accurate? You know, the, 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 the five W's and, and, and making sure that you've got it absolutely nailed down because your story is not going to be good if, um, if, it's, got, uh, if it's got some factual errors in it. Um, the factual errors, getting those wrong, are kind of the cardinal sin in, uh, in, in journalism. And one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that, that, that we all strive to do is correct them um, as soon as possible. Either you know, fix the story, but always make a notation that, that it was fixed in, in this way. Corrections in the, uh, in, in the newspaper the next day um, uh, you know, admitting those uh, those errors and correcting them as soon as possible. But I mean, this this goes without uh, saying that you, you want the stories to be accurate. And then maybe the hardest is um, is is it fair? Um, is it the, the is it a story that is showing all sides? Um, and sometimes there's more than two sides to a story. Sometimes there's three and four and five um, uh, sides to a story. Is the um, is the play of the story, um, the size, the way you're presenting it, the way the headlines are, are, are telling the story, are those display elements, are they fair? Are you playing it too far down? Are you playing it too far up? Um, uh, have, you, have you made sure that you've, you've, you've talked to everybody you possibly can to on this story? But if you can answer those three questions on what you're presenting as content, um, is it news, is it accurate, and is it fair? If you can answer yes to all of those, um, those three basic questions, then you're in pretty good shape. Um, then you've you know, probably got an ethical piece of reporting that has led to an ethical piece of, um, of content. Um, 
you know, there are, uh, I need one, one more slide. The Society of Professional Journalists is a trade organization, a little something more than that. It's a professional organization. It's been around for about a uh, little more than 100 years, I think. They have a code of ethics um, that a lot of newsrooms use. A lot of newsrooms have their own um, uh, unique codes of ethics. Some of them are three or four pages long. Um, some of them, in the case of the New York Times, go on for chapters and chapters and chapters. I mean, literally, the, they're, they are books. Chicago Tribune's got a relatively large um, uh, uh, guideline of, of, of ethical, um, a book of ethical guidelines and policies. Um, but I always liked, and what we used at the Sun-Times was the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics, which I've got here, basically is on one page. Um, you know, some of these other places have these much longer things. But ethics, as you, as you might imagine, is nuanced. It's not a black and white kind of, kind of situation. And we never really wanted to box ourselves into a policy where, you know, the, the issue of the day didn't really quite fit into that box or that policy. We wanted to be able to um, really look at things from a variety of different angles and, um, and make a decision based on um, some clear thinking, deciding who, who or, or what might benefit or, or, or not from whether we did a story in a certain way or not. The Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics is all on one page, and I'm not going to read the entire thing to you, but you know, it's kind of interesting to, to see how it boils things down, I think, quite, um, quite nicely. They have, on the next slide, Father, there's four um, basic elements. Seek truth and report it. Minimize harm, act independently, and be accountable. Okay, those are those are four broad, um, uh, sweeping statements. If you think about it, though, those are those are good things. If you're in the media business, um, or or really in any business, um, to 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 keep in mind, when they're talking about seeking truth and and uh, reporting it, among the things that we're talking about there is giving people. Um, uh, the opportunity to respond to allegations of wrongdoing. Again, that's kind of the is it fair question. Identify sources whenever feasible. Um, you don't want people going off the record. You don't want to be using anonymous sources on, on um, uh, you know, important stories. The credibility, the, 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 the the honesty, the truth of a story is greatly enhanced if you've got sources who are willing to be named. Um, sometimes that's impossible, but what you're looking for is the sources who will talk and be ready to, um, to be named. If you've got a source that wants to be anonymous, um, make sure that you're questioning their uh, motives before promising anonymity. Um, you know, if somebody's life is in danger, if somebody's um, livelihood is in danger, and they are the only way to get at that story, um, those those might be instances where you would you would offer that that condition of anonymity. But it should not be something that is just sort of given away by anybody that that, that asks for it. Um, you know, you don't want to be involved with any. Um, reenactments or staged news events that's if we're talking more from a broadcasting perspective at this point when you're presenting something visually you want people to know that that what they're seeing is actually what happened if you have to get into a reenactment it has to be very very clearly labeled and um, it's a very good idea to avoid um, undercover or other surreptitious methods of gathering information except when traditional open methods will not yield information vital to the public. In other words, you don't want um, the news media to be in a, in a game of gotcha or um, uh, you know, being in kind of a, uh, almost a uh, law enforcement um, mode. Um, investigative journalism is great. Sometimes there's no other way to get at it, but by and large, you want to avoid undercover um, entrapment kind of situations. Never plagiarize it. It goes on from there. Under minimize harm, a um, couple things to remember is, you know, you want the journalist to show compassion for those who have been uh, uh, affected adversely by news coverage. Um, you know, it's an interesting situation where most of the people who are in the news didn't ask to be in the news. Um, it just happened to them. 
the Kardashians, the Lindsay Lohans, they, you know, they've asked for it. Um, but by and large, people, um, the news just sort of happens to them and they are thrust into it. Um, and, you know, not every story is a, is, is a life or death um, uh, uh, situation or an embarrassing kind of situation, but by and large, people just have been thrust out of their normal lives and into the news, and you have to be conscious of, of, of what, what that means and what they're going through. Um, pursuit of the news is not a license for arrogance. You know, you, you, you as a journalist, person of the media, want to be um, want to be operating on an objective level playing field, and just because you're the news person does not mean that you can be you can be arrogant. You don't want to um, intrude into anyone's privacy unless there is you know some sort. Again, there's always a, a there's always a gray area unless there is a overriding public need. Um, you might then want to want to probe into someone's privacy, but by and large, you want to leave leave that alone. Under Act Independently, um, this is about this is about freeing yourself of any um, interest other than the public's right to know. This is about having no conflicts of interest, having no even perceived um, conflicts of interests. Uh, if you have a conflict of interest as a reporter, you need to talk to your editors about it. You need to recuse yourself from a story. You need to recuse yourself from that conflict of interest altogether. Um, you don't want to, you never want to have a conflict of interest. You don't want to be reporting on your friends. You don't want to be reporting on somebody who your family has business dealings with. Um, uh, I mean, those kind of, those kind of obvious uh, things. You don't want to give um, even advertisers um, favored treatment, even though they're, they're footing the bill. Um, you know, they're, they're paying to be in the paper or on the broadcast. They don't get any special treatment. No other special interest should get, um, should get, should be able to influence the news coverage in any way, shape, or form. And, you know, this, this gets down to things where we would have to ask some of our reporters to remove um, political signs from their houses. You know, the, 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 the husband might be a reporter at the paper, the wife might be a uh, fan of Governor Gwen. So she puts a, uh, uh, a, a lawn sign, you know, during election season for Governor Quinn on, on, his, um, on his front lawn. And we, we kind of looked at that and told everybody, you know, try to avoid that. I mean, you're out there trying to cover politics independently, objective, objectively, and you can't have an advertisement on your front lawn saying, I'm for this guy. So it's all about acting independently, making sure that there's, you know, I'm speaking um, uh, figuratively here, but making sure that you're paying your own way, that people are not buying you lunch, um, that you're not beholden to anybody, that no favors have, have, have transpired. And then finally on this is, you know, be accountable. Um, and, and I touched on this a, a little bit, that you want to correct any errors um, as quickly as possible. You don't want to be hide behind them. You want to be upfront uh, about that. Um, you want to admit them, admit the mistakes and correct them almost immediately. You want to likewise kind of expose the unethical, <clears throat> um, the unethical practices of some of your brethren. There's nobody who covers some of the um, what would you call them, flaws or, or, or the ethical flaws or ethical crimes in the journalism media business, there's nobody who covers those better than other journalists. Um, you know, there's, there's not much that goes wrong that is swept under the carpet. It is one of these kind of um, um, self-cleaning mechanisms where, where what I call the journalism police, in the best sense of the word, are always out there looking for any sort of ethical breach that is out there and they will write about it and they'll publicize it as, as a way to kind of kind of keep things as, as, as clean as possible. Um, you always want to be clarifying and explaining news coverage and inviting dialogue um, with the public over your journalistic content. You want to have engagement with your readers or viewers on an everyday basis. Um, the, the, the new media, the, the, the internet, the blogging, all of the, 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 the tools, the, the commenting on, on your blogs, the commenting on your websites, all of those tools have made that, that level of engagement with your readers that much more prevalent, that much more um, available, which has been a, a, a great thing. But you also almost want your your operation to be thought of as almost like a public utility 
where you know everybody gets it, everybody's aware of it in some way, and everybody can pick up the phone and feel like they can call and, and, and be in that, that conversation with you. That you're not above and high and mighty, you're not hiding anything. This is as, as broad and open a conversation as you can have. So, you know, when, when, when you're talking about ethics in, in storytelling, it is, is it news, is it accurate, is it fair, and then does it, does it follow, fall into any of those, those four kind of categories? That's kind of the how-to of the business. It is um, one of the weirdest businesses out there, though. Not just you know the reporters doing their job, just journalism media as a business. Um, this is a we, we talk a lot about the the separation between church and state. This is an interesting slide. I think this is somewhere in Schenectady, New York. Um, but uh, church and state. Is, is what's, what's always talked about, you know, where there is some sort of a some sort of a split between two two different large entities. And in the media business, it is the split between editorial, which is what you would consider to be the stories, the news, the content, and advertising, the business end of the business end of things. Um, and like I say, it's one of the weirdest businesses ever. What what you're looking for in most businesses is um, is to make your customers happy. Um, to, to, to make them want to keep coming back. You, you take their money and you give them something in return. That's always been the, um, the equation in the media business. Advertisers come to you because you've attracted this, this very large audience and they want to reach that audience with their, with their advertising. Um, the, for the most part, the business is based on advertising, but in the media business, your advertisers have no say in the product because you got this separation between church and state. You can't have advertising or the business side influencing in any way, real or perceived, the editorial product. You've got a situation where the product, the newspaper or the TV, um, the broadcast facility will frequently write or broadcast or say negative things about advertisers and their products. Who ever heard of such a business where, you know, on the one hand you're taking money from from people on the other hand, uh, out the other door, you are potentially insulting them. Um, it, it is it is a it, it is not an everyday kind of problem. It's not an extreme problem, but that tension is always there. The people that are footing the bill are basically fair game um, uh, if they do something wrong, if they are newsworthy. Um, the businesses want to control their advertising, and their public relations, in a very controlled way, but you know, they may be subject to the uh, to, to the whims of the editorial department if they think that there is a good story there. Um, this, the, you've got this pressure playing out on, on a variety of, 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 of different um, platforms. I put up, you know, a one star here. I mean, we all know that movies are rated on kind of a star system, but you think about plays and you think about restaurants, um, you think about reviews of, of any commodity, um, you frequently, and think about the movies, there's a lot less movie advertising in, in the media right now than there used to be, but there used to, there, there used to be page after page after page of movie ads, and we, you would frequently run reviews of those products and give them one star, or no stars, or two stars. You know, here's somebody who on the one hand is footing the bill, paying the bills, and on the other hand, I'm frequently on the same page, you are denigrating their, their, their product. Like I say, it's a, it's, it's, it's a weird business. You have, um, you know, a situation where if the advertiser might love the fact that they even got covered, um, that we got one star and at least our name was mentioned, um, you've got other advertisers who are saying, hey, how come I wasn't mentioned? You know, you guys did a, a, a big spread on the winter, the winter coat season, um, and you know, you went to every store, took pictures of, of all these coats, but you didn't come to our store, and we're one of your advertisers. You know, that kind of pressure is, is, is always there. The reporter doing the story, who knows what their thinking was. They might not have thought that that store had a particularly cool um, thing to, to, to shoot that year, and that's why they, they, they didn't do it. But you've got that kind of pressure coming in. You've got a situation sometimes where the, the advertisers will threaten to pull out, you know, if, if you don't change your coverage or if you don't give us some coverage. That's the kind of... Um, uh, pressure that the executives in, in the media business have to make sure that they are um, uh, ready to stand up to. Um, you've got advertisers who want special favors. 
um, you know, they want their ad at the top of the page, or they want the, they want a story printed on top of their ad, or they want they want their ad cut up to be put on different parts of the page. Anything to get gather attention, and you know, you want to be able to hear them out. You want to be able to to work with advertisers who want to be creative, but but you've got this this kind of constant pressure um, coming from the advertising side of things, um, the business side. Father. You've also got a you know, situation where you've got pressure, ethical pressure, coming from the government. Um, the government, both large and small, um, big and uh, or, you know, national and regional and, and, and uh, right down to the local level, um, they're almost like advertisers. Uh, you, know, you don't write about the advertiser every day, but you pretty much write about government um, in, in one form or another every day. So they are always under the under the microscope, and if you're doing your, your, your kind of watchdog role correctly, they're, they're going to be upset um, on occasion, or, or maybe on more than a couple of occasions. Um, but you've got a situation where you've got pressure that might come from them. Um, you know, they are in charge of licensing, uh, they're in charge of zoning. Um, if you're operating with real estate, they, they ultimately have some control over where you might want to move, where you might want to go, how you might want to set things up. Um, you know, they can apply a certain amount of subtle pressure um, that, you know, hey, if you guys are not, not going to play ball, we're going to have trouble on, this, on this, this other business side of things. Doesn't happen all the time, but there are subtle um, indications of that. And again, you have to be ready to just draw that line and say, no, this is we, we do what we do, and you know we'll let the chips fall where they may. You've got a situation where government frequently will try to get in the way of you protecting your sources. We talked about anonymous sources a little bit earlier, and sometimes you just have to have anonymous sources, and um, you need to protect them to the to the full extent. They they they've gone. They've told you what you needed to know. Um, you've promised them anonymity, and then if the government, um, law enforcement, wants to come after you, come after you and say, "Hey, who was that that said that?" and help our investigation, um, you need to be strong enough to, to to stand up and say, "No, we're not gonna we're not gonna do that." Um, and frequently, those kind of things will get quashed in the early stages in the courtroom. But as you know, there have been cases where reporters have ended up in jail while all of this is is being sorted out. That's government pressure. Um, you also have government pressure. Some when they are um, trying to halt publication of something. Um, usually, uh, it's not like they call all the time and say, you, you know, you can't run this story, but it's usually if there is a, you know, kind of a pressing public safety or national security um, uh, cause, they will, they will say, you know, can you hold off publication, can you hold off publication for a couple of days or a day, whatever it is, that's government pressure kind of an ethical situation where you have to really, really go through, uh, you know, a whole list of checkpoints on, on do we, do we follow what, what they, what they want to do or don't we? And it's not, I don't mean to paint the media as, as always, you know, going against everybody. If there is a, if there is a clear public um, safety issue, national security issue, that the, that the, the public's right to know is maybe less than the national security um, issue. Well, then, yeah, you would you would probably go along with um, with with that request, and and, and that happens on, on occasion. Um, this is a picture of the boss. Um, you've got you've got you know constituencies in the house in your own building um, who who get upset with what you write or print or broadcast on occasion. Um, They've got their own business concerns. They've got their own political aims, um, uh, and the wall between church and state has to be kept as high and strong as it is with advertisers, as it is with uh, with politicians, with your own owner. Um, you know, it's not to say that they can't make a stink, that they don't have a loud voice, that someone's not going to listen to them. But you you try to you try to make sure that the frontline players, your reporters, your photographers. Um, your cameramen, your uh, your anchors are not really dealing with the boss because that would just be too much ethical pressure um, or unethical pressure to, to 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 put on them. So, like I say, it's a weird business. You you are you are being you are being funded by traditional advertisers who you might write bad things about. Um, you've got the government coming after you. You've got your own your own bosses coming after you, and you've also got go ahead. You've also got. You know, a little, a little internal pressure with the readers, and, and I talked here about you know eating your spinach a little bit. 
it goes back to what I was saying about the Kardashians versus you know covering hunger in uh, in the city. Um, I think good journalists, all journalists, feel an ethical dimension on what it is they're doing and what is it that we are presenting. Is it um, you want it to be news? You want it to be engaging? You want it to be entertaining? You want it to be informative? Um, you want people to read it. You want people to to, to actually pay attention to it, um, but. Are we providing um, enough of what they really need to know? And that sounds presumptuous and patronizing, but, but I do think that that's an ethical dilemma that if the media doesn't provide some of this information, or at least try to provide some of this information to inform people, to give them uh, an indication of, of, of who, who to vote for, um, what's really happening in the city, what's really going on with government, then it's not going to come from, from anywhere else. You occasionally get calls from the readers who say, you know, why did you do that big five-part boring series on whatever? Um, and sometimes it is, it is you know, that, that, that almost ethical dimension of this is what you need to know. It costs us a lot of money on, on, the, on the media side to, um, uh, you know, pay for the reporters to do the work on the five-part series. That's a lot of newsprint and ink and broadcast time and bandwidth to, to broadcast that five-part series. But, but I think it's, it's interesting and important that that kind of um, dimension still exists where, you know, let's, let's try to do something that is not necessarily market-driven that if we did research on this, we would show that you know the readers are not going to turn to this as the, one of their top five things, but it needs to be done. And you still see that happening um, uh, in the news media, thank God. And that's an interesting little ethical, uh, ethical dimension. Um, and I you know, just put a, a, a final um, slide here about the New World Order with some of these uh, <clears throat> media companies and um, uh, logos on, on a Rubik's Cube. Um, because you know things have obviously are obviously changing um, in in a big way. I hope that the ethics that we're talking about have not um, are, are not going to be changing. But you now have a situation where you know I, I talked a lot about traditional media and not worrying about these outliers. Too bad that the outliers paint the traditional media in kind of a bad way. But now we've got a world of outliers. You know where virtually everybody can be a blogger where everybody seems to be a blogger at certain times. Um, you know, anybody is a photographer, anybody's a publisher, basically. And you've got a, you've got a situation right now where um, uh, I think ethics are, are going to be more important than, than, than ever before in terms of people you know, knowing which are the operations that are truthful, are credible, have that kind of um, code in operation, because otherwise there's just too much information out there. And you know, it's it, it, it's one of these things where you're you're seeing so much more opinion showing up in the um, in in the, the I call them the news hole, but the, the 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 news outlets, the blog outlets, all all over the uh, all over the nation at this point. Stuff is you know, it's all opinions. Opinions are fine, but it's kind of unfiltered. It's not objective. You got people need to get their literacy about um, about media. Um, they got to raise their literacy rates a little bit as to as to what's going on. And, and, and what is going on is, is changing the landscape in, in a dramatic way. And you know, we'll have to see how that plays out. But the, the organizations that are ethical are going to be the ones that I think will, will last. Um, in, in just, you know, I, I wanted to be able to answer some of your questions, but I also wanted to, to, to give you a couple quick examples of, of some of the ethical um, dilemmas um, you know, that, that organizations, large and small, have, um, have encountered along the way. Um, you know, it's it's sometimes small things like when to when to name names. Um, you know, you've got somebody's name; um, they haven't been charged with a crime yet. You can't wait until tomorrow morning's deadline. You've got you know the internet that's ready to go with whatever news you have. When do you name names and somebody involved with uh, you know with with a crime? Most places wait until there's been an official charge. Um, sometimes the nature of the crime is so. Huge. Um, the interest is so big. Everybody wants to know, you know, who did it. That um, there's there's pressure to to actually run those names before um, before a charge has been placed. Those of you who remember Steve Bartman from the Cubs situation, a couple of you. I mean, Bartman was the guy who was in the stands who um, put his hand out and knocked the the, the ball away from uh, the Cubs outfielder and. 
destroyed the Cubs' chances of, of winning the World Series. Steve Bartman, a guy thrust into the news. He just went to the game. Suddenly, he is the scapegoat of, of all of Chicago for all time. And, um, you know, security knew that this guy that night, um, security knew that this guy's life was in danger. They hustled him out of there. Sure enough, the next morning, a couple of news media organizations did get his name. He was not charged with anything. He was never going to be charged with anything. He was just an innocent guy that went to a baseball game, thrust into the news. But what do you do? I mean, tensions were so high at that point over this kind of stupid incident that um, you never knew that if, you, if, if this guy was named, he was going to be killed, um, that some nut would go and, and kill him. And um, I think the news media was backing off in general. Um, trying to respect his privacy, despite the fact that he'd been thrust into the news. Um, eventually, one of the broadcast outlets did name him. And, you know, you're put into a difficult position of the cat being out of the bag at that point. Um, you know, and, and gradually the other, the other media started to name him. But that was a very, very interesting ethical dilemma. This was a guy who was the center of the news. Um, uh, on, you know, kind of, a, kind of an interesting, innocent play. What do you do with his? What, what do you do with his name? Um, you know, you've got a situation where you've got victims' names, especially in case, especially with kids, especially victims of sexual abuse. Um, what do you do with those names? Do you use them, or if you do, when when do you use them? Um, you know, a lot of the major media talk dealt with issues involving the um, cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad that appeared in um, Scandinavia a couple of years ago and set off, you know, a, a, a lot of rioting um, all over the, uh, all over Europe and the world. Um, a lot of death resulted from that. In America, you know, there was a reaction um, like, well, gosh, we're not going to be afraid. We're going to print those cartoons. Um, each year, a series of cartoonists, editorial cartoonists, want to have a day where the cartoonists all, all do, a, do a cartoon about about those images, um, you know, what do you do? Um, uh, do you e even in the initial coverage of those cartoons? Do you print them again? Um, you know, is the news that compelling that you ought to print them and run the risk of setting off a, you know, a firestorm in, in your community? Um, or you know, do you take a do you take a, a more nuanced approach? Years ago at the Sun Times, there was a. Um, we all know that in Chicago, corruption is, is big. Political corruption, people always with their hand out. Um, and we opened, this is back in the 70s, we opened our own bar called the Mirage. Um, and it was a Mirage. It was run by the Sun-Times, but it was you know set up as a new bar in town. We had a reporter was the bartender, and we had some cameramen behind the seat, behind the mirrors. Um, taking pictures and watched over the months as one after the other city inspectors showed up with their hands out. You know, you want to have a sign installed, okay, it's going to cost this much. You want to have this zoning variance, it's going to cost this much. And, you know, it turned out to be a wonderful, famous series, a book, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and sometimes did not win the Pulitzer Prize for it. They were blackballed at the last minute by one of the judges, none other than Ben Bradley of uh, the Washington Post, um, Watergate fame who did not like the fact that there was entrapment um, involved. Um, so, you know, that, that's one of, those, one of those issues where could you have gotten the story in other, any other way? Probably not. I mean, it was an audacious um, way to go about it. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, but the code of journalism was kind of there at the highest level saying, good and interesting as this story is, we're not going to give you a prize because you've kind of, you've kind of violated, the, um, you violated the code. Father, um, just a couple of other quick examples. You know, this was a this was a, uh, a story you might have remembered from only a couple of months ago. I think it's not even a year, but you know, this is a guy. If you can see above the word "doomed," there's a man there that's his hand up on the ledge. He's in the subway gutter um, or tracks, pushed on the subway tracks. This man is about to die. Um, big story in New York City. Um, probably the type of thing that happens at least once a week. Um, but in this case, you had actually a picture of it, and this caused a huge ethical dilemma throughout the industry. Um, you know, certainly it's newsworthy, um, uh, you know, to have this kind of a picture and, and, and to look at these kind of safety concerns. But, you know, 
is it is it accurate? Yeah, it's it's accurate that that's what was happening. Is it fair? Is it fair to that man? Is it fair to the readers to have to be confronted with this? Um, these are kind of the questions that that, that that run through your mind. You know, is this enough to be to be the front page um, uh, image? And should you go there? Um, the New York Post obviously did, but but. When I talked about the journalism police earlier, you know, this is what I'm talking about. They all kind of came out and there was a huge debate as to, as to whether or not you should have done this. Father, um, this is a, this is a, similarly, I believe an image from the, or, uh, from the images from the New York Daily News um, following the Boston Marathon uh, bombing. And I believe the picture on the left, and luckily you can't see it because of the lighting, it's rather gruesome, it's the real image. Of, of a man who was wounded in the uh, in the attack, and you know, kind of a gruesome depiction of his leg all torn up. When the New York Daily News ran the photo the next day, I believe on the front page, um, they altered it. They photoshopped it in some way to kind of clean up that uh, that wound. And you know, all all heck broke loose on on this front because the one thing you don't want to be doing is altering the truth. Uh, you know, despite their intentions of not offending their um, their readers or upsetting them over breakfast and and the fact that the overall photo you know certainly told the story this is a huge no-no to to actually physically alter a uh, alter a photo and you, you run across these kind of dilemmas all the time father one more um, this is you know an ongoing series at the sun times this is one of the nephews of the former mayor daly who was involved in a um, street brawl on division street I don't know, seven or eight years ago, and this rather burly um, nephew of, um, of, of Mayor Daly um, hit this guy, who was much smaller, knocked him over, he banged his head on the, on the, on the ground, and he died eventually. And there's you know, some indication or implication that the police didn't really follow up with the investigation of this story the way they should have. They sometimes kind of unearthed a lot of stuff about it over the last several years, and has been in, engaged in you know months and months and months and months now over a period of years a series of you know story after story after story looking at this um, looking at this situation and where it stands right now is that you know a special prosecutor was named the case is being reinvestigated um, the daily nephew is in big trouble and will be um, undergoing I believe trial for manslaughter um, and. You know, it's, it's kind of good old-fashioned investigative journalism with some interesting ends. The ethical dilemma here is, you know, was this played up too much? Did we devote too much firepower to it? Is the story really all, all that important? And is any good being done seven, eight, nine years later in, in terms of um, uh, unearthing this whole thing and, and putting this daily nephew through, through all of this, this turmoil? Again, some, some interesting ethical questions. And then, you know, finally, as an example, R. Kelly, the R&B star, was involved in, uh, uh, you know, uh, theoretically or allegedly involved with um, lots of dealings with underage um, kids sexually. And we were presented with a videotape of one of these encounters. Um, and we used that, among other things, as a basis for a huge series of stories on um, R. Kelly and that part of his life. And he eventually went to trial um, and, and eventually was uh, was exonerated, um, but we we got the videotape of what we thought was R. Kelly, which I still think is R. Kelly, and an underage what looked like an underage um, girl involved in a, a series of sexual encounters, and um, we knew we were going to write about it, but we also knew that we were suddenly in possession of child pornography, and that we had we had seen something that was um, a crime, you know, on videotape, and we presented that evidence to the Chicago Police Department, and they proceeded with their own investigation, which led to the charges, and it was interesting that within about a week, we were vilified um, for helping the police, that that is not the job of the journalist to help the police to aid in the investigation in any way, um, and we were just sort of stunned because, you know, we thought that was kind of the natural and right thing to do. And if, if you happen to have evidence of a crime, why would you not, um, you know, certainly write about it and do your thing, but also um, uh, turn it over to the police. So interesting, interesting concepts, both large and small. Um, interesting look at, 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 at the day-to-day -day of the business and some of the pressures, some of the, some of the calls that you have to make. If there's any quick questions, I'd love to take them. Stunned, stunned silence. <laughs>
Sure. Uh, one, thanks for a really fascinating introduction to you know, the high level of understanding of journalism and editor standpoint. Um, I, I was wondering too if you had had any instances where your, your business was uh, found itself in a dilemma about stories that might really promote other significant businesses. So it's sort of um, like, you know, these big stories about either stockbrokers or an investor, investment firms, or even say something like a product like the iPod or something that's coming out. When is it news? When are you basically advertising for these people? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question, and, and, and it's about hype. You know, when are you part of the hype machine? Um, I remember, and again, this is probably ancient history to some of you students, but when the when the next wave, or what I would call the new wave of Star Wars movies were coming out, you know, the, the, the next three, and this is 10 years ago or longer, um, we did some sort of a countdown in the paper. You know, you've seen that kind of stuff before where it's 28 days until Star Wars, and, we did a story each day, and, and there was certainly huge reader interest, and you can you can measure that reader interest online very very specifically. So we knew people were interested in it, but both on staff and a couple people from the outside world were saying, you know, how come you're just on this hype? Um, you're on the hype bandwagon, and and you're not being paid to do that. You know, you're doing um, George Lucas's work for him. You know, for nothing. And and so it's it's a fair question, and and, and I, I think journalists in general don't want to be part of the hype machine. They only want to write about something that is really cool and new and noteworthy that people are interested in. If it's all those things, you should be okay. Um, if if you're just if you're just hyping something because there's hype in the air, and that the product or the subject is not not that worthy of attention, then you've gotten caught up in something something bad. Um, but you know, inevitably, there's some very good things out there that people are interested in that you're going to want to write about. Are you part of the hype machine? Probably, but but people are by and large. My experience with journalists is they the last thing they want to do is be part of the hype machine. The last thing they want to do is um, be perceived as being in anybody's pocket. The last thing they want to do, they want to, they want to zig when everybody else is zagging. Um, but you know, it's hard not to write about. It's not hard to write glowingly sometimes about some of these new products, especially some of the Apple products or whatever. I mean, there's very few poor reviews of that. Is that hype? No. You hopefully you're putting it through the objective um, filter, and you know, you're going from there. But but people do notice. Yes, sir. Could you speak about the, uh, the influences that state and local politics have had on the media, either censoring or seeing that agenda? How does that affect the media? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's no censoring. You know, as we would know, as we would think of censoring, you know, you, you publish a story and a government agent comes in and pulls out these paragraphs and nobody sees them. I mean, there's no censoring um, that goes on. It's a little bit more um, nuanced than that, um, and, and it comes down to things like um, access. You know, access or lack of access is kind of a form of censorship in a way. You know, if, you, if somebody will not talk to you, if somebody will not grant you access, if somebody is giving somebody else access and not you, um, those are, you know, ways it can, it can play out. You also have a situation where, I'm not gonna name any names, but the current mayor, um, you know, is, is a master of, of, of controlling or, or the media. Um, you know, his, his team is very much um, proactive in terms of um, jumping on any story that is written, making their views, you know, usually negative views known, pushing back, you know, as, as much as possible. They're like the classic baseball manager who argues every call with the umpire. Um, they're very careful about access. Um, they are, um, you know, they're trying to manage it in, in a way the likes of which we had not seen before. It's very much the way the Obama White House, my understanding, manages things very aggressively, um, uh, very transactionally, you know, for lack of a better a better term. But but that's where that's where it plays out in terms of access and access, um, uh, you know, displeasure, aggressiveness, um, coming after you after something is 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 written about. Um, not talking to you, you know, it's, it's, it's those kind of things. 
Um, and, you know, frequently we run into the, some of the bigger problems, not necessarily an ethical issue, but some of the bigger problems are on the smallest, most insignificant levels. You know, most of your problems with the Freedom of um, Information Act or the, the Open Meetings Law are in, in, you know, fire protection district meetings in some of the smallest towns in the state, you know, where, where the officials are trying to control access that way. Um, and that is a form of censorship, and, and there's various organizations out there that are trying to, you know, hear about that as soon as it happens, make sure it doesn't happen again. But sometimes when the stakes are at their lowest, you know, is where you run into the some of the some of the more iron curtain kind of uh, sounding problems. Anybody else? All right. Can I ask one sure. So just, um, I know some of the students are in management. Uh, as market share has shifted, you know, to the internet away from print media and things in a place like sometimes, has um, how would management handle that kind of pressure for sort of sensationalism or whatever other tactics might be used to boost readership? How how did that play out, say, in the last few years? Um, how how management would handle pressures about all the three standards that you want to answer about any story versus just, you know, real economic pressures and market share? Yeah, and it's a, it's a good question and, and uh, one that is certainly in the newspaper business in America not unique to this market or not unique to, you know, to, to the Sun-Times or the, or the Tribune. They're all dealing with with those kind of um, issues. What's interesting in Chicago is that, you know, you could say, um, well, gosh, let's, let's, we're losing market share. We've got to do something to attract readers. What's the easiest way to do that? Well, you can either invest in all of this, you know, hardcore New York Times, overseas investigative journalism, et cetera, or you can go down market with something more tabloidy and something more sensational and something more celebrity driven. What I found, and what's interesting, is that Chicago is not exactly a tabloid crazed marketplace. It's not like New York. It's not like um, London. Stuff you can get away with in New York, people don't want to hear about here. You know, this is much more um, meat and potatoes, nuts and bolts kind of kind of town. Not that they're not interested in, in celebrities, but you know, uh, any time over the many years, myself or other managers, you know, tried to. Um, juice up or spike up the sometimes you know even one or one day a week with something a little bit more unusual something um, not the usual um, uh, bread and butter we we'd hear all about it and sales would would actually go down so it's a you know it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting dilemma um, what does seem to be still working in in the world of the media where we have somehow given so much away um, all the media went onto the internet in 1994-95, and in some sort of collective lapse of reason, we decided to not charge anybody for anything. And we're still trying to put that genie back in the bottle at this point. So, you know, generations have grown up expecting to have all of their news, all of their content um, uh, for free. But what seems to be working, and the jury is, is out, is, you know, paywalls in, in a limited fashion. But you have to have something behind that paywall that is excellent, you know, that's not celebrity pictures, you can get those anywhere. It can't be a commodity, it can't be something you can find on your phone without, you know, too much trouble. It's got to be something that is either incredibly high quality, or something you can't get anywhere else, or something that is so locally interesting um, to me that I can't live without this news. If you put, if you've got those things behind the paywall, and you've put some resources to make sure they happen, that seems to be gaining some traction. Um, at this point, but I don't think the answer, certainly not in Chicago, is to go downscale. You know that hasn't played out. Anything else? All right. Thank you.